It is an inspiring story. This people in formation. During the latter part of the 17th century, faith communities known as Anabaptists were fleeing to North America. In the hopes of freely living out the Mennonite values that shaped their beliefs. Among these communities forming in this new land were the River Brethren, who lived along the Susquehanna River in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And as they began to grow, they expanded across the Midwest and to as far as California. And by the late 1780s, land had become available north, and families of the River Brethren began to migrate to Upper Canada and to the Niagara Peninsula. And here, their leader, Houndsley Winger, would guide this early faith community known as the Tunkers, which was the German word that describes this fellowship that would often dip their parishioners in the river to celebrate their belief. In the early days, the meeting house was the home. And when they outgrew the homes they lived in, if a suitable barn couldn't be found, one would be erected. And Houndsley Winger would give leadership as the first bishop of the Tunker Church in Canada. These early settlers enjoyed the freedom to practice their beliefs of nonviolence and not only worship Jesus, but to follow him in practice. But the War of 1812 would test these values. Persecution made life hard for the Tunker community. In spite of an agreed payment between conscientious objectors and the civil authority known as the militia tax, many would lose livestock and be threatened with violence. And in 1918, a young E.J. Swam, a future bishop of the Brethren in Christ Church in Canada, would be imprisoned along with Earl Sider for their convictions of nonviolence. But this was not a setback. Non-resistance was under test, as E.J. Swam would write in his memoirs of that event. This was a people of conviction. These hard times forged this community together. And the Tunkers grew. Meeting houses had been established in Waterloo and York Region, and during the 1930s would fully change their name to the Brethren in Christ. By 1863, meeting houses had been established throughout Ontario, whether in homes or barns, and the first Sunday school was started in Humberstone near Port Colborne, Ontario. In 1871, the first General North American Conference was held bringing solidarity to this geographically diverse movement. And by the 1890s, the North American Conference shared the Evangelical Visitor as its communication vehicle. And a passion to join God in His redemption work moved the Brethren to expand not only in North America, but around the world. over the next several decades would see the U.S. and Canadian missionaries head to Zimbabwe, Zambia, India, Japan, Cuba. By the 70s, the Kellys and Siders were sent to Nicaragua. In the 80s, Spain, Colombia, the United Kingdom. And Gordon and Susie Gilmore sent to Venezuela. And Mark and Jane Sider to Malawi. And in the 90s, we saw workers sent to Mozambique, Thailand, Mexico, with names like Maine, Collier, and Flag among a new generation of missionaries and into a new millennium, we are seeing the Brethren in Christ communities spread across Latin America, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Honduras, El Salvador. And as this movement expanded across North America and around the world, this northern migration into Canada would expand as well. 1905 would see a move to Kindersley and Delisle with names such as Winger and Baker and Kleimenhaga establishing farms and opening churches in Western Canada. In 1932, the Niagara Christian College would be established. By 1959, faith communities in Hamilton and Saskatoon were starting. By the 1970s, churches were starting in Canadian cities like Calgary, Kitchener, Mississauga, Fort Erie, and by the 1980s, Barrie, Burlington, Oakville, Penetang, and Quebec City saw BIC churches being planted. This growth would bring new ideas to share these values. This would become a people of change. Camp Cockwell would be purchased in 1962 as a creative place to share their common past, present, and future. The BIC would join in the forming of the Mennonite Central Committee, which oversees the Anabaptist response 
the violence and need in the world. BIC would also join the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada in 1964. And the 1960s would see much change within the denomination. The expression of musical worship would take on new contemporary forms. Even how this faith community was seen within culture would radically change, as members would let go of their more conservative appearance and embrace contemporary styles as a positive move towards loving our world. These decisions, while not easy to make, demonstrated the belief that they couldn't be contained by external formalities. Their values and convictions transcended culture and formality, and the Jesus they followed transformed them from the inside out, and that's how they would influence this world. Culture would be transformed, not by merely creating a new one, but in redeeming the one we live in. And this would become a community that follows Jesus that shares his message and extends his peace around the world. And we represent centuries of faith and convictions. And the road ahead is just as promising and as inspiring as the one behind. Well, I am very excited about spending the next few minutes talking about where we fit in the larger family of faith called the Brethren in Christ. And this is really an opportunity for us to discover ourselves in relationship with God. God calls us into relationship with one another. And so to understand who I am, I learn about who my brothers and sisters are in the faith in our local church. And then to understand more about our local church, we look at our denominational context and then we see all of that in the wider context of the body of Christ around the world and stretching back through history. And that helps us understand our place and our part. And it's a beautiful part of who we are. So this is a real privilege for me to be able to spend some time talking about that and to be talking about it with Doug Sider. Doug Sider is uh, our guest today who is, if we, his, his former title was Bishop. They've updated it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I like Bishop. It's, uh, it, 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 it's, if we had a Pope, this would be it. So why don't we welcome Doug Sider. It's really great that he's here. Good to be here. Thank you. All right, so Doug, uh, yeah, you used to be called Bishop, and then we got all contemporary. What is it now? What do you uh, call you? Executive director. Executive director for the Brethren Christ for in Canada. For BIC Canada. In Canada, all right. And then uh, that's your name, the ti your title. What about the title of the denomination, Brethren in Christ? It's not the hippest name, Doug. It's our attempt to be contemporary. We used to be called Tunkers. And, uh, that's true. We, yes. So Tunkers was a Dutch word from Pennsylvania that meant to dip. Uh, we baptized forward three times, and so we contemporized, I think it said mid-30s, to Brethren in Christ, when the Word had more of a sense of community. So that's where it comes from. We are in the midst of a conversation beginning in the next week or so here. Uh, we've already started it, but it gets more formal, more quick, uh, in the next little while, about changing the name Brethren. And uh, recognizing that in our world it just does not. Hey, in fact, the question: Where are the cistern? Yeah, where yeah. are the sisters? And yeah. um, it it has all kinds of connotations that just aren't helpful. Yeah. And so it will. All right. I, I want to be careful to say it will change. I am predicting it will change. That's fantastic. Very good. So, uh, and um, so so that's something we're looking at in, the, in heading into the new year. Yep. As a denomination. And that's one of the things I have loved about the Brethren in Christ is this openness to change, which even the name Brethren in Christ, as you said, it was contemporary. It I mean, was. When, you're, when your current name is Tunkers, Tunkers. Brethren in Christ is a real step up. But it, it, um, yeah. you're right, I love this openness to new things. Okay, so let's talk about our past a, a bit more, that where we come from, if we rewind the clock back to our Anabaptist beginnings. Yeah, without going through the whole story that was in the video, yeah. Um, we were an Anabaptist group, very clearly Anabaptist, that um, those people at that time in 1788, 1789, uh, were very concerned that it had become mechanical. So we believe in peace, we believe in simplicity, we believe in being separate, um, and we do these things to do that. Mm. And there was very little emotion. And so uh, we grafted in very early on, it was a part of this group of people that we have this pietistic fervor, and they would use language like a quiver of the heart is what we're looking for. That a quiver of the a heart. A quiver of the heart, that, that when we go to the meeting house, yeah. which all of our churches would have been called in that, uh -huh. um, there should be a quiver that occurs, that in our daily walk with God, our heart should be moved and stirred, and it was kind of the emotional side yeah. 
of the Anabaptism. How many of you in the last year have used the phrase, a quiver in my heart? <laughs> it's not common, but I get the point. So what they're saying is, uh, part of the danger of early Anabaptism as it evolved could be that people would lose the centrality of Jesus, the fervor, the relational connection, and just say, being Anabaptist means these are the things we do. This is how we do it. So there's this renewal movement of saying, yes, but this is also about a personal, heartfelt yep. connection with Jesus. With Jesus that transforms. So that's changes. the pietistic part. So you have the Anabaptist part, and you have the pietistic part. Then we added in, um, and it, it really fits, kind of a Wesleyan holiness that said, okay, where's this fervor going? And it landed at a sinless perfection that uh, ultimately, as a follower of Jesus, we could come to the place where we don't sin anymore. And so that really, up until the middle part of the last century, was a significant part of our teaching. Um, we had it in our statements, we believed it, we preached it, we taught it, we tried to live it. So Classic Wesleyan holiness. Classic Wesleyan holiness. So literally, um, when I was bishop with that title in the U.S., I remember the day. It happened one time, a guy came to me and said, I gave up sin on May 17th, 1962. Not a sin, just sin. I just sin. gave up just sin. gave it all up. Done with it. Great. And, um, and so that was kind of his perspective. Now, we haven't taught that in half a century, but yeah. it was part of who we were. And so, it really influenced our behavior and yeah. led to some really uh, difficult parts of our history where uh, it would induce guilt on people yeah. inappropriately. We made some bizarre decisions. So some churches have a break where they go get coffee and juice or whatever. Well, our break back then was the men would repack their cheeks with tobacco <laughs> and the women would repack their corncob pipes. And that all worked well. We were good with that. But as soon as the women wanted to see the sisters again, as soon as the women wanted mm -hmm. to move to cigarettes because that's cleaner, we said, well, no, that's a thing of the world. We don't <laughs> do that. And so we'll just get rid of tobacco. And so... It had so, that kind of weird impact. This emphasis on holiness just degenerates into a nitpicking legalism. legalism. Yeah, yeah. So this is a fascinating thing about the Brethren of Christ history is that as it starts fervently wanting to live for holiness, it actually starts to become more legalistic and then hits a point of denominational repentance. Denomination? I find fascinating. Sociologically, just speaking at that level, this is a fascinating thing to see oh. happen for an entire denomination to get to a point and say, we need to repent of where we have been headed. Oh, and Tell we did. That. In 1950s, um, a group of young uh, leaders from the BIC, Brethren in Christ, went uh, to the National Association of Evangelicals, which is the U.S. equivalent of our Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, and discovered there that there are other people who follow Jesus, who admire the scriptures, who hold them in high esteem, who connect with the world. And they're not evil and they're not falling away. And this was, a, in many ways, a kind of a transformative thought. Hmm. And this realization that we could actually have an impact and make a difference and not just be our sectarian self. Yeah. And so they talk about a night of prayer, of repenting, of seeking God, and that really began to launch this idea that we, we need to be more than just, you know, who we are and, you know, 10 familiar names and, and so on and so forth. And so that just led to things like double in a decade. It led to, which was this, you know, we're going to double our size to church planting to, by the mid 80s, things like Up Ropes was launched, which became the meeting house in Oakville and so on and so forth. And which was all new to us. Because Anabaptists, we had become good at uh, at being isolationists. Yep. Uh, we just, would church plant, uh -huh. but it was for economic reasons. So four families would move from Niagara Peninsula to Markham for farmland. And they'd start a church because they didn't want to join another church. It had right. to be us. Yeah. We did that in Kindersley, Delisle, all over the place. Right. Okay. So you have this isolationism, which you can understand historically where it comes from. Our first few generations were persecuted. Uh, by other Christians. So when we move over to North America, our idea is just keep to ourselves, hunker down, and hope nobody notices us, which is really bad for evangelism mm -hmm. uh, or for any sense of fulfilling the Great Commission because you see the world, including other Christians, is just a potential threat. So we're going to just stay separate, stay separate. So this is this beautiful repentance that we learn from evangelicals that they care about telling others about their faith, which means they're going to have to have contact 
with non-Christians. Yep. Whole new concept. Whole new concept. So we repent of that, and we repent of our legalism. Yep. And so we start dressing more freely. More freely. We don't exchange one legalism for another. We don't we say, don't. now you're not allowed to wear plain dress. But so you, can go, you could go to a, a, so, a Brethren Christ conference and see all men are plain dressers and then more contemporary dressers. So we, we highlighted the value of community, that, mm-hmm. that it's more important to be together. And so you would go, I remember going to a general conference in the U.S. and there's Bruxy sitting next to a lady with a dress she probably made wearing a head covering and very conservative. And yeah. we didn't bar one or the other. We said, mm-hmm. let's figure out how to get along and, and communicate. I remember when I was first uh, attending Brethren in Christ uh, conferences, and I would be sitting beside someone like that, and I think this woman wandered into the wrong conference. We'll have to find her room afterwards. And she was probably thinking the same thing about me, but saying, you know, hopefully he can stay here and maybe he'll get saved. So we had, <laughs> right, but it was, but we're all we're really different experiences, yeah. all just hanging out together. And I had other people ask me at the time, that must be really weird, or how does the, how's the meeting house accepted by the brethren of Christ? They're looking for the dish, for the kind of the underbelly. What's the story? What's the division? And what my experience was and has been consistently, consistently is this beautiful mutual encouragement uh, of, of actually loving the fact that there's this diversity that usually doesn't find a way to coexist within the same denomination, but would, would, uh, would somehow lead to a severing or to a split, all just hanging out together as family and encouraging one another and thankful that we have each other in the same denomination. It has been a beautiful experience. It has been. There's been a real recognition that the community matters and allow the community to speak. Yeah. And so we, we work at that, whether it's in theological issues or practical life issues, of how do we listen to one another and, and figure it out and be right. welcoming. And, and the key piece is what do you do with those who, quote unquote, would lose a debate? Hmm. And we've never been one who cut off. We, hmm. we say, okay, we've moved, but you're still a part of the family. Yeah, and how beautiful. do we handle that diversity? Beautiful. All right, so we got rid of the corn cob pipes. Gone. Uh, Men didn't have to uh, have beards with no mustaches. They didn't. Although for some of us, we just have an edge up in the whole holiness department. I understand. All right, so we, it's allowed. We, we, get, <laughs> we get rid of the legalism, and we move into the present now. After this time of repentance, we are, who are we now, if, if you get to know the brethren in Christ? Yeah, in Canada, we are about 12,000 people <clears throat> who would use uh, the moniker BIC. Which is small. That's, we're, Which is small. We're a small denomination in the greater scope of things. Very small. 12,000 total across Canada. Total across Canada. That now, means, that sociologists means... put us at 20,000. Okay. Actually, they do, but we would count 12 in terms of attendance. Would that say over half is a meeting house? Uh, about half. Be about half. So if we wanted to throw a military coup and take over. <laughs> it is fully possible. It's fully, but okay. But... But <laughs> we'll, we'll have another conversation yeah. afterwards. Yeah, but that would be unhelpful, I think. Uh, and, and it really goes against your whole peace teaching. It's I mean, kinda it really, does. It really kinda, does. It kind of does. But the, and you know what's really beautiful is the idea, as the meeting, I will say this, as the meeting house has grown, sometimes people would say, why don't you just go independent? Because, you know, your denomination is small. Why don't you guys just, and I would think, what an oxymoronic concept for a Christian. I, uh, I wasn't calling that person oxymoronic. Uh, I was saying the comment was that to be independent, an independent church, to say why do we want to get away from our roots and the family that kind of bore us, that, that placed us here, that's all part of who we are. And the idea of submission, I think, is as important as a church grows as when a church is small. It's just something we would never want to be without. So there is this beautiful, I, there's a beautiful blessing in that kind of connection that I think we are, we're here for the long haul. We're excited about it. Well, and it's, it's unique. I can say this as I travel in my circles with denominational leaders. I do get asked, so the meeting house is your church? Like, it's part of you? Yep. You, you like them? <laughs> yeah, they're pretty great people. And, well, do they like you? Well, what they tell me they is they do, but I, I mean, you have to ask them. And, and this tension of large church denomination, we just yeah. have not experienced it, mm. at least on my side. No, it's beautiful. It's been a wonderful yep. relationship. And what you've been for us is a picture of, again, there's another way to do things. Mm. Church doesn't have to look like this box, right. and we just duplicate it, but there's other ways. And so it's been a wonderful part of BIC Canada to see our congregations learn from what you do here mm. and to apply it in their context. So now the Brethren of Christ in Canada has accepted the meeting house as one particular expression out of three. We yep. have, we've kind of got three sub-brands. Three Most sub- denominations organized by geography. So yeah. BIC, West, East, Central right. kind of thing. 
we decided, I didn't, I wasn't at the table at the time, but it was decided to organize by expressions, we call it. Uh, mm-hmm. Style, that's not quite right, but uh, the first is our classic or our community churches, and they uh, would be, um, we want them to be invigorating, life, healthy, all of that impact on their community, but they would be centered more around gathering on a Sunday morning and going out from there. Then we have the meeting house with your 17, 18, 19 sites. It's an expression. And then we have what we call the network, and that is led actually by Matt Vincent, and that is our church planting. It's our R&D. It's where we do new things and are uh, having fun. And there's about probably in that one, I'm going to guess 1,500 people that have okay. developed over the last couple of years. Fantastic. Um, there's a vision statement, a mission statement yeah. of the growing faith community, following Jesus, sharing His message, and extending His peace around the world. And um, yeah, that's beautiful. Can we put it, put it up on the screen? It's a beautiful statement that's just worth I, our purpose statement. Right? We are a growing faith community, following Jesus, sharing His message, and extending His peace around the world. It the uh, first time I came across that, it just had a resonance, just rang true, like this is the community I want to be a part of. Well, what we're trying to get at is we're a community. We're not individual churches, we're a community. Uh, We really are about Jesus, so that's not Bruxy's message and Mm. just the meeting houses. Mm. We want that for all of our churches and sharing his message and then extending his peace really gets to everything, compassion, it gets to evangelism, it gets to how we do church, that we don't want to... We want to be people of peace. Mm. And so in all of that, it, it has been helpful. Beautiful. And then out of that, if I can talk about it, we've mm-hmm. developed four key strategic initiatives. That, yeah, yeah. because that's where we're headed in, in the future. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So we want to be a church that renews, that multiplies sites, and develops creative expressions of church. So mm. we're doing that. Matt Vincent's leading a reunion church plant. We have a, a, a podcast church that we're experimenting with. What, what is that like? to develop a church on a podcast, will community sprout up? Um, We're looking at a work in Montreal. Uh, We're talking about some works in Eastern Canada. And then we just launched a site in, uh, out of one of our older churches, launched a site in Kitchener. And so we're just working at multiplying expressions, engaging Mm -hmm. young leaders. Um, We're doing a lot of work there. I think we have, and I'll use this word, I don't allow these kinds of words in my home very often, but I think we have maybe the greatest intern program developing. Mm. Uh, Krista Hesselink is working with us on it. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. Um, (laughs) And it's called Flow. I think you can go to flowinternship.com or something. And uh, it's a design your own internship. But we don't just want people who want to be pastors. We're looking for Mm. all professions to Mm. develop leaders who follow Christ uh, in the arts, in medicine, whatever. Mm. And so we're working at that. And then uh, we want to embrace the communication revolution. We have Facebook, Twitter, and all that, but we recognize we're not doing that as well as we could. And then we want to cultivate mutual compassionate relationships and Mm. serve the world in partnerships. And so we're doing that with some projects overseas. Mm. Um, And so God is, is really on the move. Mm-hmm. and using us as BIC across Canada and um, using our people. And those are kind of the four things we're trying to do to maximize that and with some focus. It's beautiful. My experience with the Brethren of Christ has been uh, it, a, a beautiful communal expression of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, sometimes when groups of people get together, it doesn't always bring out the best. It brings out yep. divisiveness or criticism. or divin- There's been a real gentleness a history of gentleness uh, that even going to a Brethren Christ business meeting at a convention, just the way people talk about budgetary issues. I remember in the early stages just sitting there saying, I love these people and they're modeling the fruit of the Spirit to me while they're talking about something that I'm not particularly jazzed about, you know, budgetary, whatever, but the, these, their heart is coming through. So I feel real privileged to be continually mentored by, by this one expression of the diversity of the body of Christ. So thank you, Doug. My privilege. Now, I know I'm cutting into your time, so I'm going to get out of your way and just let you teach what's on your heart to us for the last few minutes. Thanks. Got it. Thank you. As I begin, let me just say, uh, and we referred to it in our time, what a privilege it is uh, to work with the staff leadership here at the Meeting House. Um, you are, many of our churches are blessed with their pastoral leadership. You are very blessed as well. And I have a deep appreciation for the team of people uh, that provide leadership here, the board, the staff, and so on, and am humbled 
when I get to interact with them. And so you, uh, that's just my word of affirmation to you as a church and to your staff. Um, over the last number of years, and there's a number of reasons I've been thinking about this, I've been reflecting on the distractions of life. And I've realized that some distractions in life come about by just pure coincidence. Life has distractions. They happen. I've also realized that some distractions come about because of the sin of someone um, or just human brokenness. So my wife and I lost a baby uh, in utero, and I remember standing there holding my wife, and it was a disruption in our life. It was a disruption in our plans, and in those moments, we often wonder why why God, or God, do you see this, or God, what is happening? And I've also come to the conclusion that there are moments of distraction, moments of change, where it's God working and moving in the divine is sensed in a real present way. When we give birth to a child, and for the first time we hold a baby, and we realize this is my offspring, a gift from God, we sense the divine. And I've come to the conclusion that it's possible in life, in the easy and in the hard, in the um, moments where we sense God, in the moments where we don't, when life is normal, when life surprises us, in all of that, it can be a picture of God on the move. It can be moments where God is working. We all know, well, many of us know the story of Joseph. It begins in the middle part of Genesis, and he was a young man who was despised by his siblings, sold into slavery, ends up through a whole uh, series of events to be the second in command in the land of Egypt, and he ends up saving perhaps millions of people from an impending famine. And in all of that story of deep pain and tragedy, there's never a mention of God to the very end. When Joseph is reflecting on life and what has happened, and he says this to his brothers who've now come to Egypt, he says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. Now, putting aside the theology of his statement, we learn from his understanding that, you know what? In the midst of all this pain, God was doing something. We then fast forward that story to Exodus 1 and we learn that the Hebrew people who came from Joseph and his descendants had grown significantly. They'd multiplied. And the Egyptians grew fearful that there might be an uprising and so they enslaved the Hebrew people. And again, all we see is this significant picture of pain, a people who are enslaved and no sense that God is even present. And then in Exodus chapter 2, and I'm not going to read it. You can read it this afternoon. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 in particular, we begin to see that God might be doing something. A man by the name of Moses is born, and the Pharaoh had given the order that boys and children born were to be um, put to death. And Moses is snuck into a basket and put in the river, and the Pharaoh's daughter finds him, and and ends up asking Moses' own biological mother to raise him or to nurse him, and then he returns to Pharaoh and becomes, again, a prominent leader in the land of Egypt. But he has a deep sense of justice, and so he murders an Egyptian guard who's beating a Hebrew slave. And then the next day, he realizes he was seen, and so he ends up having to go into hiding in the land of the Midianites. And there we find him, and again, very little mention of God, no sense of what's happening, just pain. And all of a sudden, Moses encounters God. And we read about it in the latter verses of chapter 2, and, and God says to Moses, I have heard the cries of my people, I have remembered my covenant with Abraham, and I'm going to respond. Now, in Moses' mind, I am pretty convinced, because this is how us as humans tend to be, I would be, that's great, God. You go strike the Egyptians. In fact, the more painful you can make it for our suffering, the better. But we learn something about God 
that was true then and I believe it's true today. When God chooses to move, when God chooses to do a new work, when God chooses to respond, He engages human activity. He does it through people and persons. And so in chapter 3 and 4, we just see this unfolding. God's response involving human engagement. We see it in the story of Christ's birth. He engaged Mary and Joseph. We see it in Christ's ministry. He, he, couldn't, he could have just come and done his thing. He engaged the disciples. We see it in the Great Commission that Bruxy spoke about a minute or two ago. He engages all of us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, not in church, but where we live, where we work, where we spend our time. He says, you go be my witnesses. You go be my light. And we begin to see this trend through the scriptural narrative that while sin is disruptive, while life can be disruptive, that when God works, he's disruptive to our lives. He unsettles it. He makes our lives uncomfortable. When God chooses to move, when God chooses to work, it challenges our comforts, it challenges our expectations, it challenges our assumptions. When God chooses to work, we see this idea that it's going to cost us our time. It's going to cost us our money. And sometimes it's going to cost us our dreams. And all through the biblical narrative, whether it's the story of Moses going back to Egypt and leading the people out, whether it's the story of an angel appearing to Mary saying, you will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. There's just this sense that when God moves, it disrupts our lives. Moses responded as we often do. I, I, I don't have the skill set to do that. I, I, I can't do that. I can't speak. We get mired in the details. Well, what about A, B, and C, or let alone? Uh, what about X, Y, and Z? focused in on strengths and weaknesses. And God says, no, when I move, I move through human activity. I move through a human agent. But it's my strength. It's my glory. It's my power that does the changing. And it won't make sense from a human perspective. And this is how God works. We see it throughout all of the grain of Scripture. In Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, I want you to go to a land I'm not telling you, but out of you I will build a great nation, and that great nation will be a blessing to the world. That was the Hebrew people. And out of that nation came Jesus. And out of Jesus comes billions of followers of Christ all around the world just being his light. Exodus 2, Moses, lead my people out of slavery to the land I will show you. Judges 7, Gideon, you have too many people to fight. You're depending on your own strength. Strip it down. Luke 2, Mary, you found favor with God and you will give birth to a son. It's just God's modus operandi. When God works, when God moves, he does it through human agency and it disrupts. So I want to give you three observations that come out of this and then three applications or at least things to think about. The first observation, observation is this, that divine intervention, the movement of God is disruptive and unsettling. This is a problem in our Western context. I have a lawyer who does my will. I have an investment advisor who tells me where to put my money. I have all kinds of advisors for all kinds of things because I want my life ordered and I want to be able to predict what's going to happen. Perhaps the greatest thing we need to do as followers of Christ is land on the issue of disruption, divine disruption in our life. Because God has been doing it this way for millennia, 
And I get no indicators that he's going to change his strategy. When God moves, he engages people. Secondly, I'm learning that God is at work in circumstances long before we ever piece it together as human beings. The story of Moses didn't begin with Moses. It started with Abraham. It started with a man named Joseph who was sold into slavery. It started with a people who were multiplying and enslaved. It went through Moses. It crescendoed at Jesus who came and said, I am the hope and the light of the world. I want you to have life abundant. It continues today as people like you and me are followers of Jesus, living our lives, being light in life wherever we go. And it ends with a new heaven and a new earth. And in all of that story, we see our segment, but God's been at work long before, and he'll be at work long after. And so often, at least I, forget that. And the third observation is this, that delivery for God isn't just from something. He always delivers us to something. You see, God could have ended the slavery in Egypt. But he wasn't just delivering people from slavery. That that was the second part of the story. He was actually calling a people to what he called the promised land. He brought them from slavery, from Egypt, to the promised land. And from this people came the Christ. And then he says to them, and now you're going to go to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's always a call from, but also to. That's how God moves. So what's the application? We need to remember that God is faithful all the time, even when God disrupts. And so in our family, my family, we talk about that, how God's faithful in the disruptions. I didn't expect to be in my current role. I was sitting at my desk at a job I loved, executive pastor at a church in Pennsylvania with a staff that I loved, I'd built. It was great. Got a phone call and my life got disrupted. And God's been faithful as you move a family of six from one life that they've known to a totally different context. For my wife and I, it was coming home to Canada. For my kids, it was a different country. And over the last months, we've talked about the faithfulness of God through this whole journey of God disrupting our life. We need to see the faithfulness of God. We need to talk about the faithfulness of God. We need to secondly look and listen for God moments in our lives. I'm trying to learn the habit that God or when life, when sin, whatever it is, disrupts my life. Where are the places in the middle of that disruption that God is working? See, my temptation is to woe is me. And instead begin to say, God, in the middle of this disruption, I don't even know if it's just life, if it's you, if it's someone's sin, is it my sin? Doesn't really matter. Where are you working? What are you asking of me? And then the third, we need to deal as followers of Jesus in the Western world, with the issue of divine disruption. It is the way God has worked through all of Scripture and recorded history. And are we comfortable to allow God to disrupt our lives? I have four kids, and it's interesting that I would want this because I grew up in a family, and my one brother's in Pennsylvania, my mom and dad are in Kitchener, I live in Welland, and my other brother's in Vancouver. We're all over the place. But my dream is, as my four kids grow up, that they go to university, they get their degrees, and then they find jobs and spouses that live within about 5.3 kilometers from my house. (laughs) And it's my prayer that they are fruitful and multiply and have lots of kids, and that every Sunday night at 5 o'clock, they come to my house, 
and we get to have a family dinner. If you watch, uh, oh, it's a cop show in Blue, Blue, Blue Bloods. I, that's my favorite scene. And I'll tell my, that's my vision of our family in 20 years, right there. That's what I want. Most nights or mornings, I go into the room of one of my kids and I kneel while they're sleeping, just sit on the side of the bed or kneel, and I pray for them. And my prayer is short and it's simple. Lord, may Preston, may Grace Ann, may Carter, may Ashley, may this child grow up fully committed to you. May they follow you with an abandon. But a year and a half ago, I'm walking out of the room of one of my kids. It was Ashley. And it hit me before I hit the, the bedroom door. Do you really mean that prayer? Because here's what I've learned. If all four of my kids do that, one of them may end up teaching at an inner city high school in Chicago. One of them may end up as a medical doctor serving AIDS patients and malaria victims at the Macha Mission Hospital in Zambia. One may end up teaching English as a second language to immigrants in downtown Toronto. One of them could end up as a pastor in Saskatchewan and we'll always wonder what he did wrong. But when we pray that prayer, we're giving God permission to disrupt our dreams, our hopes, and our wishes. And friends, my call to the church across Canada is let's be a people who don't just bear light on behalf of Jesus, but be a people who to Jesus say, you have permission to use me, to move through me, to disrupt my life and to take me places I otherwise wouldn't go. Because I know, God, that you're faithful. And I know, God, you work in those moments of disruption. That's my encouragement to all of us. Is to wrestle to the ground the question, are we comfortable, are we willing to let God disrupt? Father, I give thanks for this day. I give thanks for this church. I give thanks for this, your people. And whether it's here or at a regional site or at any of our churches across the big world, may we be a people known for loving you, looking like your son Jesus, being his hands and feet, and saying, God, we're willing for you to disrupt our lives. May that be our heart. May that be our soul. In your name we pray. Amen.